So welcome to what I believe is ses session six of our year with Bayard Rustin. And, you know, it would be reasonable to think that after five second hours, we've kind of exhausted um, the topic, but it turns out that uh, with a life as full and rich and active as Rustin's, there's always more. Um, so today our focus is going to be on some of Rustin's civil rights organizing um, and a particular attention to Rustin's participation in acts of civil disobedience and nonviolent direct action. I actually am going to skip about a decade of the middle of Rustin's life, um, kind of from the mid 50s to the mid 60s, um, which may seem a little strange given that this was a very tumultuous time in the United States and that Rustin was in the middle of much of that tumult. Um, So as an example, or two examples of what happened during this decade, um, Rustin was heavily involved with Dr. King in the Montgomery bus boycott. Um, and Rustin was the kind of main organizer of the March on Washington um, for jobs and freedom. But I think you actually already know that. Um, we've already just talked about that at least a little bit. And so what I'm going to do today is talk some about Rustin's work before that decade, and then a little more about his work after that decade and try and pull it together in, in, in some sense. Um, I do have one request for all of you today, and that is to think about Chloe's presentation from last month, also in the context of what we're discussing today. To be an out gay black man in the United States in the 40s, 50s, and 60s was an act of direct action. Uh, considerably after the fact, Rustin gave an interview to the Washington Blade, which um, was the uh, newspaper in DC. And he was talking about his experiences integrating interstate buses. And he started telling the story he says, as I was going to the second seat in the bus to go to the rear, a white child reached out for the ring necktie I was wearing and pulled it. Whereupon, its mother said, don't touch a N-word. If I go and sit quietly at the back of that bus now, that child who was so innocent of race relations that it was going to play with me, will have seen so many blacks go to the back and sit down quietly that it's going to end up saying, they like it back there. I've never seen anyone protest against it. I owe it to that child, not only to my own dignity, I, own it, I owe it to that child that it should be educated to know that blacks do not want to sit in the back. And therefore I should get arrested letting all these white people in the bus know that I did not accept them. And then Rustin goes on, it, occur, it occurred to me shortly after that it was an absolute necessity for me to declare homosexuality, because if I didn't, I was part of that prejudice. I was aiding and abetting the prejudice that was part of the effort to destroy me. So Rustin living his authentic life 
without shame, without prevarication, despite the potentially severe repercussions, legal and otherwise, among other things, was a moral and political act. It was an act of nonviolent direct action. And I'd like to kind of keep that in, 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 in focus as we talk about um, kind of the more explicitly civil rights oriented work that Rustin did. So let's go visit Rustin as a young man, um, mid 1930s. He's in his early 20s. He's just moved to New York City. Um, he's involved in the cultural life of Harlem. Um, he runs across the Young Communist League and joins it. Now, at that time in the United States, the most, the best organized, most visible advocate for civil rights was the Communist Party. And the Communist Party attracted quite a few uh, African American militants. Rustin was only one. Um, some joined the party, some were kind of party adjacent. Um, but Rustin actually joined the, the Young Communist League. And it is unclear exactly how active he was in it. He certainly participated, um, he identified as, as, as such. Um, and he spent you know, a good five years um, as, as a member. Um, in 1941, so like I said, about five years after he joined, um, when uh, Nazi Germany invaded the Soviet Union, the Communist Party as a whole, including the, the Young Communist League, um, dramatically shifted focus to opposing um, Nazi Germany to the exclusion of everything else, um, specifically including any uh, racial reckoning and, and amelioration, um, which caused quite a few of the American African, the, the African Americans who had been um, involved with, with the party to leave, and Rustin was one of those. And he really never. Um, was close to, to the Communist Party after that. Um, he, he felt it, as, as many activists did at the time, he felt it was a complete betrayal. Um, at that time, so in, we're, we're talking 1941 here, um, Rustin joined the Fellowship of Reconciliation, which was a faith-based, uh, primarily anti-war, peace-oriented organization. Um, he became the youth secretary. There at that time was a generational shift um, in the Fellowship of Reconciliation between a uh, kind of an older generation of Quaker peace activists and a much more militant um, younger generation that was as interested in civil rights as, or, or saw civil rights as part of the same uh, struggle as pacifism, as, as peace more broadly. Um, Rustin's focus as youth secretary was primarily on, on voting rights and um, employment discrimination. Um, he organized interstate bus rides. Um, he also kind of, as, as the, the um, quote that I read earlier, um, personally took stands that, that uh, brought him in conflict with the law, even on intra, you know, municipal buses, which, which were not covered by any protective legislation at the time. Um, he had been influenced by Gandhi and Gandhi's 
uh, philosophies of, of Satyagraha and Ahimsa. Um, so, so nonviolent direct action. Um, and increasingly he saw the struggle for civil rights, for freedom, for equity as being intimately tied to nonviolent direct action, so that that was the, the strategy and the method that was most likely to bring about significant social change. Um, the Fellowship of Reconciliation ended up being kind of an incubator, a launcher for a number of other organizations, one of which was the Congress on Racial Equality Corps, um, which had an enormous influence um, on, on the civil rights broadly. Um, Rustin uh, was working pretty much full time for CORE. I mean, he was being paid by Fellowship of Reconciliation, but since, since CORE was a spinoff, he got to do that. As a slightly separate thread in, in, uh, in American politics, um, A. Philip Randolph, who was primarily a labor organizer, um, started talking about a march on Washington to protest Jim Crow in 1941. Um, this alarmed the federal government to no end, um, especially because this, you know, the, the, the Second World War was, was happening in Europe. The United States was not quite yet involved, but the, the, the federal government um, and um, President Roosevelt in particular did were very afraid of any activity in the United States that would splinter or weaken what clearly was going to be a massive war effort by the United States in the foreseeable future. Um, so FDR uh, actually issued an executive order that prohibited job discrimination in the federal government and in defense industries. And that was sufficient for a Philip Randolph to call off the march for the time being. Um, but in the six to nine months that all of this was brewing, again, it was Rustin who was the prime organizing force um, but, but behind this initiative. Um, in 1953, as, as uh, Kate mentioned in an earlier talk, uh, Rustin went to prison for draft resistance. Um, this was despite the fact that he could have applied for and virtually certainly would have received conscientious objector status since he, he was a Quaker, but he refused to take that out. Uh, he uh, felt sufficiently strongly that the draft was simply morally wrong and just because he had an out, um, he still needed to take a personal immediate direct stand against it. So he, he refused to comply with this draft order. He uh, declined to apply for CO status and spent a little over two years in a federal prison. Um, after he came out uh, in 1948, he took a trip to India and Gandhi himself had been assassinated a few months before he got there, but Rustin spent a great deal of time with uh, members of the Gandhian movement, um, learned considerably more about 
Gandhian nonviolent direct action, Satyagraha Ahimsa. Um, he comes back to the United States and among other things, travels around the country, um, training young activists, mostly young, but training activists uh, in um, Gandhian methods of, of resistance and social change. Ultimately, he leaves the Fellowship of Reconciliation. He is hired by the War Resisters League, um, where he spends the next uh, 12 years as executive secretary. And as part of the War Resisters League, again, his focus is primarily civil rights, as well as anti-war, and especially kind of anti-Cold War. The Cold War was kind of starting up um, activity. One of the episodes that just kind of tickled my fancy um, that I came across is, uh, so in the mid fifties, civil defense drills, you know, kind of the duck and cover stuff um, were beginning. And, and, you know, every school, biz, office building, this sort of thing um, was expected to take, practice taking the steps they would take in the case of a nuclear attack. And so there was one day in, in 1955 when there was a coordinated effort across the country in all institutions to have a national simultaneous civil defense drill. Um, like I say, throughout the country. Um, Dorothy Day, who was with the Catholic worker at the time, um, in particular thought this was just insane. You know, the idea of being able to protect yourself from a nuclear attack was, was ludicrous. And uh, so she called some people, including War Resisters League, um, specifically Rustin, and said, you know, we kind of got to do something about this. Um, so at noon on the day when the civil defense um, drill was taking place, uh, Dorothy Day, Bayard Rustin, and about 18 or 20 others um, quite ostentatiously walked up and down on the sidewalk um, in New York City and, of course, were arrested. Um, Kind of to their surprise, uh, the judge who was who, who handled you know the the booking was extremely antagonistic. Um, he called them murderers, and he set a unprecedentedly high bail. For, for these 2022 activists. Um, they, they did raise the money and, and get out of jail, ultimately. And strangely, I have not been able to find out exactly what happened after that um, in terms of was there a trial where they could, you know, kind of what happened. But the fact that these 20, some of them quite, you know, well-known or at least notorious um, activists had been arrested for not participating in a civil defense drill um, really hit the media. Um, and there was, there was broad coverage. Um, and my favorite one of all is uh, the Pittsburgh Gazette wrote an editorial that said, one would expect at most a mock arrest in a mock air raid. If we must take cover, let it be the cover of our constitutional rights. And, you know, to me, this is, this is just an exemplar of how Rustin could reach people in a way that was meaningful to them. not always, but often through acts of civil disobedience or nonviolent direct action. 
um, he had the capacity to organize events that were uncompromising, but not personally threatening, to, or at least to many of the people who witnessed them. And that's a hard thing to do, um, but he was really good at it and he did it for much of his life. So also in, in around that same time, the American Friends Service Committee published their, their booklet, um, The Truth to Power, um, a Quaker search for alternative to violence. Um, though Rustin's name does not appear as one of the authors, he in fact was one of the primary authors and essentially wrote himself um, the chapter on nonviolent approaches to international politics and social change. Um, again, there were spinoffs from the War Resisters League, just as if there had been spinoffs earlier from the Fellowship of Reconciliation. Um, the two that resonated with me, just because they're actually familiar, familiar names, was the Coalition for a Sane Nuclear Policy, which is known as SANE, um, and the Committee for Nonviolent Action, um, CNBA. Again, Rustin is at the center of both of these. Um, so he's doing a lot of work in the United States. He's also involved um, both in, in anti-war and anti-colonialist um, organizing outside of the United States. In the, I don't, I think it was 56. Um, so, so still kind of the middle of the fifties, um, Rustin, takes part in an effort to occupy a nuclear weapons test site um, run by the French government in Algeria. Uh, the, the group of, of which Rustin was a part never actually made it to the test site, but you know they, they tried multiple times. Um, it caused enormous consternation um, in the French government, as well as in other kind of colonial administrations. Um, and just in terms of a vehicle for launching serious conversation, both about the dangers of nuclear war, but also about the evils of colonialism. It was one of these brilliant uh, outreach efforts. Um, so, you know, the first 15, 20 years of, of Rustin's life um, are really occupied by three major concerns, philosophies, topics. Um, the first is equality for African Americans. Um, the second is peace, broadly defined, especially in the context of nuclear weapons, which of course were brand new at the time and, and, and posed you know, existential risk that had never been experienced before. And then what, hold, what hold, held both of these together was the commitment to Gandhian nonviolence with a specific emphasis on direct action and civil disobedience as, as kind of the methodology to do so. And that's the background that Rustin brings when he starts working with Martin Luther King um, with the March on Washington and kind of the things that, that took place during the 10 years that I'm going to skip. So let's jump forward to 1964. Um, March on Washington happened the year before. 
Rustin's approach changes quite notably. So in 1964, um, with strong support from President Lyndon Johnson, um, the Civil Rights Act is passed, which was, you know, over the vocal and strident objection, um, especially of Southern Democrats, but of kind of unashamed bigots throughout the country. Um, there's a presidential election coming up. The candidates are Johnson, um, who became president after um, Kennedy was assassinated and was actually running for the first time for, for president um, as the Democratic nominee. Barry Goldwater was the Republican nominee. Goldwater was a right-wing libertarian who really was set out to dismantle um, social protections, legislation, um, and, you know, kind of a social safety net. Um, so that was the Republican Party. And there was a third party candidate, um, George Wallace, who was kind of the voice of the established explicitly racist Southern Democrats. Rustin looked at that situation, thought about the passage of the Civil Rights Act and came to the conclusion that the most effective way to institute social change in the United States was to work with the Democratic Party um, to transform the Democratic Party into an instrument of social justice. Um, and that it was time to stop being an outside and agitating from outside and to begin working within the Democratic Party. Um, at the same time, and then especially a year later, the, the Voting Rights Act was passed again um, with the strong support of, of Johnson uh, and at least a piece of the Democratic Party. Um, Rustin, Rustin's analysis led him to believe that the struggle for legal protections was kind of well underway and that what really the focus needed to be on economics rather than on, on politics. Um, so he uh, becomes deeply invested in an initiative called the Freedom Budget, which um, is kind of the, 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 the effort to take a lot of the money from the military and other parts of the federal government and shift them towards social assistance. Um, because Rustin sees economic discrimination as the most powerful force oppressing people of color in the United States. Um, at that point in time. And he also sees um, economic justice as an issue that can unite uh, working class African-Americans, working class blacks with working class whites. And so he believes that this would, this, this is the best strategy for moving forward from the beginning of, from, from the mid sixties forward. Um, this actually made him extraordinarily unpopular among uh, the, the American left, the, most of the American progressive movement. So, you know, late 60s, we're, we, we see the rise of 
much more militant anti-Vietnam War activity, you know, SDS, etc., as well as the emergence of uh, Black nationalism and the Black power movement, um, kind of growing out of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating uh, Committee, SNCC, and, and others. Um, Rustin, so Rustin thinks those, those are misguided. Um, and he's very public about it. Sometimes actually in a kind of weird way, you know, in, in a bit, you kind of wonder why did he do that? But, but he writes articles and he gives talks um, about, you know, opposing, opposing the black power movement, opposing black nationalism, um, opposing much of the anti-Vietnam War activity that was taking place. I mean, those were a little different because the, 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 isu the issues he had with black nationalism were, uh, I, think, I think really principle-based. I mean, he just felt that this, this was not a fruitful way to approach social problems. Whereas his issues with the Vietnam, with the anti-Vietnam War protests were kind of confused with his support of the Democratic Party. And so though Rustin himself was pretty clear that, that this war the United States was fighting in Southeast Asia was morally indefensible, he took no public stand. And he did it or, uh, from time, you know, he, every once, you, you can pick things out of some of his talks that, that indicate that, that he um, opposed the war, but this was not a focus for him. Um, and in part, that was explicitly and deliberately to not alienate the Democratic Party leadership because he felt he could have much more influence as, as an insider and that that would make a bigger difference. Um, Rustin lost, I mean, we've talked about Rustin as the least known important activist of that period in time. Which, which I think is true. Um, but of the people who knew about him, which, which was all the major organizers um, in the country at that time, he really lost credibility. Um, so the freedom budget that, that he had been advocating, um, you know, which, which kind of got conflated with Johnson's war on poverty or part of that effort, um, actually failed miserably. And for one of the first times in his life, Rustin failed to assemble the coalition that would have been required to bring this to fruition. Um, so the fact that he had alienated a lot of his former colleagues, peers, um, comrades, um, really worked against what he was trying to do next. And this goes on for a number of years. Um, then by the mid seventies, um, Rustin kind of turns into an elder statesman. And he, he's working for Freedom House um, and for the International Rescue Committee primarily during this time. Um, Rustin kind of becomes an informal ambassador for human rights um, from the United States. Uh, he travels all over the world. I mean, just some, I kind of listed some of the countries that he went to during this period, and they include the Dominican Republic, Zimbabwe, El Salvador, Lebanon, South Africa, and Barbados, Uganda, Somalia, Sudan, Pakistan, Guatemala, uh, and multiple countries in Southeast Asia. Um, he is especially advocating for refugees from Southeast Asia, 
you know, in the, 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 the war in Vietnam kind of ends in 75. So there's an enormous influx of refugees from, from Southeast Asia, not just in the United States and Europe and in other parts of the world as well. Um, and so this is, this is his focus for much of the rest of his life. Um, kind of refugees in particular and more broadly trying to dismantle the remnants of European colonialism um, in, in the global south. Um, he exhibits an absolutely unwavering support for the state of Israel. Um, he publishes many critiques of the Palestinian liberation movement, which again, you know, loses him, uh, causes him to lose a great deal of credibility among the American left. So, so his position kind of before 1955 and after 1965 are pretty radically different. Um, From Rustin's point of view, I believe, there it's the same struggle. It's just that conditions have changed and so strategies and tactics need to change along with those conditions. Um, but like I say, it was not perceived that way. He was perceived honestly as a sellout. Um, as far as I can tell, he was never particularly bitter. I think he was disappointed, um, but he does, he, I would have had much stronger emotional reactions were I in his position. I, I didn't see kind of the expression of, of, of that in him. You know, like I said, I think Rustin felt that what he was doing after 1965 really was the same thing as what he was doing before 1955, just, in a changed context. So during, during this whole period, um, the struggle for equality for African-Americans is front and center always. The opposition to, to war violence and, and the, the violent aspects of colonialism are also always front and center. The commitment to economic empowerment grows. I mean, that was, it was always there. And, and he worked with, with A. Philip Randolph, you know, early in his career and throughout his career. But he, he, he really does shift from kind of more political social activism to primarily economic activism. And the strategic and tactical Gandhian nonviolence that was so central to his work kind of through the mid 60s, um, he feels has lost its power by the mid 60s. And it's not that he abandons Gandhian nonviolence, but he just doesn't see it as the most effective tactic in the conditions that he was facing. So it's, you know, it's an interesting life to watch because it's not a static life. Here was a man who spent enormous care, time, effort, analyzing the conditions that he faced, discerning what made sense in the face of those conditions, what was in his view most likely to affect deep and lasting social change. And he acted on that discernment. So that's kind of the, the broad picture that, that I wanted to give today about some of the civil rights work and especially the, um, 
the focus on, on civil disobedience and nonviolent direct action. Is the